Great, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Sierra Juliang and I'm part of the California School-Based Health Alliance. And I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on minor consent for substance use disorder services. Uh, we would take, like to take a moment to thank your California for funding this webinar. A few housekeeping items. Um, if you have not connected to audio already, here is the phone number that you can dial into as well as the webinar ID and the passcode. This webinar is being recorded and the recording as well as supporting materials will be shared on our website uh, by the end of this week. And on this next slide will be a link to our website. Oh, also we are going to be answering questions at the end of the webinar. If you have questions come up throughout, feel free to type them in the chat or the Q&A, but we will not be answering questions until the end. So just a little bit about the California School-Based Health Alliance. Um, we are a statewide nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the health and academic success of children and youth by advancing health services in schools. Uh, our work is based on two concepts, that healthcare should be accessible and where kids are, and that schools should have the services needed to ensure that poor health is not a barrier to learning. Um, we do this through a variety of ways, things like capacity building, technical assistance, workshops and webinars like today's webinar. And then this is a link to our website uh, where you will find the recording as well as additional resources. Just a little bit of information about our membership. Um, you can be a member of CSHA. You will receive conference registration discounts, member only tools and resources, as well as technical assistance tailored to your organization. If you're interested in becoming a member, you can go ahead and um, click on this link here and it'll, um, it'll take you to where you can join. And without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Rebecca Gudeman. Um, Rebecca is the Senior Director of Health at the National Center for Youth Law. Gudeman is an expert on minor consent, confidentiality, and information sharing law, and issues to access um, issues of access to sensitive health care for youth in the foster care and juvenile justice systems. In addition to her advocacy work at NCYL, she trains and consults nationally on these issue, issues. She earned her BA from Harvard University and her JD from the UCLA School of Law. She also holds a master's in public administration from Harvard. In 1997, she was named the American Bar Association's Young Lawyer Child Advocate of the Year. And in 2015, she was awarded the National Chapter Recognition Award by the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. So without further ado, I am going to pass it off to Rebecca. Thanks so much, Sierra. And sorry, my hair doesn't look quite as cool today as it as it did in that photo. Um, we're all in different days uh, now. Um, all right, I'm just going to take a second to share my screen. Um, so thank you all so much for uh, being part of today's uh, presentation. Um, Sierra, is, are we good on? Can you see the slides? Excellent. Um, so today we're going to be covering minor consent for substance use uh, treatment. Um, I'm going to take a second and be a super lawyer here. So I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm watching a lot of reruns these days. And one of the shows I've been watching a lot is The Good Wife. Um, so this is a photo from The Good Wife, which um, is basically a legal drama. It's got all sorts of other stuff, but we've got some lawyers here in the photo. So I figured that was a good thing to channel when I do this uh, required slide. Um, and this uh, is a reminder that today's presentation is just legal information. I'm not able to provide legal advice. Um, so there may be some questions that come up or case scenarios where I simply have to defer because it requires legal advice. And that might be when I say, please talk to your own legal counsel. And I know it's really annoying when I say that, but th this is why um, all I can provide is information. And I just wanted to note that today's information that being presented is based on the state of the law as of September, 2020. So as we get further and further from that date, it's important to double check and see if any laws have changed or been updated. 
Um, okay, so today we're talking about consent, but there's actually, a, consent is a word that we use to mean many things sometimes in the, when we're talking about medical care. Um, first is consent to treatment. It's getting that patient in the door. It's creating that um, patient provider relationships so that you can begin to provide services or do a uh, diagnosis of some kind. Um, but sometimes people also use the word consent to mean release of information. So once you've created that relationship, you've provided some services, done some sort of diagnosis or provided treatment, you've created information, who can access that information and who has the authority to uh, release it? Um, and that's a, a second kind of consent. And then sometimes we use the word consent when we're actually talking about insurance and reimbursement. Um, who pays, who gives permission to an insurance uh, authority to pay for a service that's being delivered. And particularly when we're talking about adolescents, we actually could have different people providing consent for each of these three different stages. Um, today, we're going to be primarily focusing on consent to treatment. So how do we get someone in the door for services? And in particular, what services minors may or must consent to uh, for themselves uh, when it comes to mental health care and substance use disorder treatment. I will do a brief review of consent to release of information, but I really want to emphasize that this is not a complete um, survey of release of information and from, uh, that could be its own webinar in and of itself. Um, so this will just sort of touch on some points um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. Um, and that's uh, hopefully we'll get through it all in our brief time together today. Um, as a uh, Sierra noted, um, your California has helped sponsor today's presentation. Um, your uh, part of your goal is to expand access to opioid use um, disorder prevention, intervention, and treatment, including medication assisted treatment. Um, medication assisted treatment is the use of medications in combination with counseling and behavioral health therapies, um, which can be a really effective treatment of opioid use disorders. Um, I mentioned that and provide that definition because when we're talking about access to treatment and services and who consents, um, today is going to focus on um, sort of who can consent to the kinds of treatments that may be part of this universe um, uh, for opioid use disorder treatment, including medication assisted treatment. All right, so who consents for a minor's care? Um, as I'm sure most on this call know, but it's worth just setting our sort of basic ground rules. Our general rule is that minors, so persons younger than age 18, need a parent or guardian to consent for care. That's our baseline. However, there are a number of exceptions in the law that allow other individuals, other adults to consent to care for minors in certain situations. Um, that might be because they're in uh, foster care or the juvenile justice system, or they're under a guardianship or an informal guardianship. Um, there's other special rules, for example, in situations of emergencies. And there are a scope of laws that allow minors to consent to care in their own, uh, on their own behalf. Um, in general, we can category, categorize those laws into two different categories, laws that allow minors to consent to their own care based on their status or their situation in life, um, and laws that allow minors to consent based on the type of service that they're seeking out, because we've decided as a community that those services are so important and we don't want any barriers um, in the way of someone uh, getting that door opened for health care. Um, in every state, there are minor consent laws. However, the range of services that you find either under the status exceptions or service exceptions are different. So I'm about to introduce what are California's laws and just be aware that um, they won't look exactly the same in any other state. Um, so status exceptions in California. In California, minors may consent to their own medical or dental care if they've been married or divorced. Um, if they're currently in the armed forces, if they've been emancipated by a court, or if they're 15 or older, living apart from their parents and managing their own financial affairs. 
Now you may run into a number of young people who say that they're emancipated, but it's critical that uh, in order to meet this definition, they've actually gone to court and, and gotten an, an, a court order from a judge that says that they're emancipated. It's a, it's a pretty difficult process to follow, but there are young people who are emancipated and it is um, something that is sort of easy to verify because it does require getting that court order. And as a practical matter, uh, once someone's been emancipated, they can actually get an ID card from the DMV that says that they're emancipated. Um, it, they're not required to do that, but just um, as an example of one way that someone might be able to demonstrate that. Um, 15 or older living apart from parents, managing their own financial affairs. It doesn't mean that they have to be fully financially independent. It does mean that the, whatever uh, income or funding they have coming in, they're making decisions about how to spend that money um, and support themselves as best they can. Um, living apart from parents, it doesn't mean that they have to be living fully independently. They may be living with a friend or an aunt or uh, the parents of um, a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend, um, they, but they can't be living with their parents. Um, what are California's service exceptions? We have a number of them and you can find more details on um, a chart that we have on our website, teenhealthlaw.org, and we'll provide a, a link to that later. But as a quick summary, it includes pregnancy related services at any age, um, sexual assault treatment at any age, um, outpatient mental health services, reportable communicable disease diagnosis and treatment, um, STI prevention diagnosis and treatment, intimate partner violence diagnosis and treatment, and what the statute calls drug and alcohol medical care and counseling. Um, and the, the ones with the asterisks all have um, require a minor to be 12 or older in order to consent for their own care. Um, we are going to now dig a little bit deeper into two of these service exceptions, the exception that allows minors to consent to mental health counseling and the one that um, allows them to consent to what is called drug and alcohol um, services. So first, mental health care. California actually has two different laws that allow minors to consent to a, a range of mental health services on their own behalf. Um, one of these laws was first introduced back in the 1970s. The other one is uh, much more recent. It's from the last decade. So um, we have the health and safety code, which says that minors who are 12 or older may consent to mental health services. And we'll talk about which ones in a second. Um, and the only criteria is that the minor in the opinion of the attending professional person must be mature enough to participate intelligently in the outpatient mental health services. Um, the family code, which is the law that was first introduced in the 1970s, also says that minors need to be 12 or older, also requires that a professional person uh, make a judgment call about maturity, but it has a third condition that the minor must demonstrate that either they would present a danger of serious physical or mental harm to themselves or to someone else without getting access to services, or that the minor is an alleged victim of incest or abuse. One reason um, the health and safety code was passed um, in this last decade was in part to address the challenges of interpreting and applying that final prong under the family code. Um, but it's important to note that instead of simply uh, amending the family code and changing the conditions, um, this, the legislature passed a second statute. So now we have two different statutes. So what services um, may minors consent to under these um, if they meet those conditions? Under the Health and Safety Code, it covers assessment, outpatient counseling, and outpatient treatment. Um, same under the Family Code. Um, it does not cover inpatient treatment, psychotropic medications, or psychosurgery. So why do we have these two different statutes? Let's use one case example um, to highlight how they, they can make a difference. 16-year-old um, Anna walks into your clinic and asks for a mental health appointment. When asked about her parents, she said she doesn't want her parents involved in her care because she doesn't want them to know that she's having some anxiety. May the therapist evaluate or treat Anna without parent consent. 
Well, if we think about the criteria under the health and safety code and under family code, both require that Anna be at least 12 years old, 12 or older, and in this case, she's 16, so she's met that criteria. The second criteria that both share is that the professional person must determine that she um, has is uh, mature enough to participate intelligently in services. So that's something that would need to be evaluated in the moment. Um, but then the, the big difference is uh, this third prong. Under health and safety code, if she meets those first two prongs, Anna can consent to care. However, under the family code, she would still need to demonstrate either that she's a danger of serious physical or mental harm to herself or to someone else, or that she's an alleged victim of incest or child abuse before she would be able to access care under her own consent. So um, the health and safety code makes it much easier for Anna to be able to open that door to care given the facts we have on the table in this case right now. What are some other differences between the statutes? Well, uh, one of them is insurance options. Um, the health and safety code includes a clause that specifically says um, services under this minor consent statute cannot be paid for using Medi-Cal. So uh, Medi-Cal is off the table if someone is consenting to care under the health and safety code. We don't have that same condition for the family code. Um, there's also a slight differences in terms of who, what kinds of professionals and agencies are able to provide minor consent mental health care. And I won't go into those details right now, but they are on um, a chart, a, a couple different charts that we have available on the website. So if you are someone who provides mental health counseling, um, it, it is important to take a look at that and make sure you understand uh, which, whether you're able to provide services under both statutes or just one. Um, all right, so we mentioned that one because one component of substance use treatment may well be counseling. And it's important to remember that we do have these two statutes available as a way to open the door to services uh, for some young people. But we also have a statute that explicitly addresses the right of minors to consent to certain substance use um, uh, disorder treatments uh, on their own. So let's look at that statute. Um, so we just looked at some of the conditions that uh, a minor must meet in order to consent to their own care, uh, mental health care. Um, there is uh, also conditions for the substance use minor consent law. However, it's a lot easier. You have to be 12 or older. There's no additional requirements to demonstrate maturity or danger to self. 12 or older, you're eligible to consent under the statute. What are the services that a minor may consent to under this statute? Um, the statute says that minors may consent to diagnosis of a drug or alcohol related problem, medical care for a drug or alcohol related problem, or counseling for a drug or alcohol related problem. Now, you'll note the language and you'll note that I put everything in quotation marks. I did that because I wanted to emphasize these are the words being used in the family code. Um, that's The statute was first enacted in the year 1977. Many of the terms that we see in that code section still date to that original statute. Um, so the terminology that we may use in, in the profession um, may be very different these days. Um, and so what I want to do now is walk through the definitions as best we can, as best as the law allows us to help folks understand what diagnosis means, what medical care means, what drug or alcohol means. So first, let's talk about that. The statute refers to someone, the ability to consent to care for a drug or alcohol related problem. What does that mean? The statute defines drug or alcohol and lists um, sort of three def definitions. It says it references back to certain penal codes, it references to a health and safety code, and it references this third and final penal code. Well, that doesn't help you very much if you are a practitioner and you don't have your code book right next to you. So let's uh, take it a step further. Um, these code sections, when you dig deeper, um, translate to meaning that uh, a drug or alcohol includes any substance that's on schedules one through four of the Uniform Controlled Substance Act, the Federal Uniform Controlled Substances Act. Um, we do have a link to that full 
um, act and the list of uh, substances that are on schedules one through four down below on this uh, slide, but some of the ones we would just wanted to call out that are in that list include marijuana, prescription main, uh, pain medications, including opioids, um, cocaine, meth methamphetamine, heroin. Um, so important to take a look at the list, but it does include these. Um, the statute also explicitly references alcohol, um, toluene, <laughs> sorry if I'm saying that wrong, and nitrous oxide. Um, why it mentions the, the latter two, that's the legislature. Uh, just wanted to highlight that it that uh, those are explicitly called out. So um, uh, any kind of problem with any of these substances are, uh, are uh, something that minors can consent to. Um, so the statute also said that minors can consent to diagnosis, counseling, medical care. So let's look at what those mean. Um, the statute defines counseling um, by saying that counseling means um, any services provided by a provider under contract with the state or county to provide alcohol or drug abuse counseling um, pursuant to different sections of um, state statute. Now, the statutes that are referenced are no longer um, relevant, um, but if you trace them through, in effect, what they cover are um, services that you might provide through the drug Medi-Cal program um, or other Medi-Cal funded programs. Um, it originally referred to services provided through our state department of alcohol and drugs, and now it's uh, those same programs are primarily found under the Department of Healthcare Services. Um, but it is uh, important to double check with your legal counsel to make sure that you understand the scope of what, how these references link back to the services that you're providing. Um, uh, so what does medical care mean? Medical care is defined by state statute, and it means medical care includes x-ray examination, anesthetic, medical or surgical diagnosis or treatment, and hospital care under the general or special supervision and upon the advice or, of or to be rendered by a physician and surgeon licensed under the Medical Practices Act. Um, and that's under Family Code 6902. Um, we will talk about medications a bit more later and, and what this may cover, um, but it's really important to emphasize that this actually includes the right to consent to hospital care, diagnosis, and a pretty broad range of treatment, um, which is different than we see in the mental health counseling uh, laws that we looked at a little bit before. So uh, just to, to dig into that a bit more, let's look at a case example. So Jordan's 14 and he's seeking help at his local school-based health center. He says he's dizzy, has stomach cramps and is feeling nauseous. He admits to having drunk a significant amount of codeine cough syrup to evaluate whether Jordan may have a substance use disorder um, and may the school-based health center provide a medical exam and engage in services with Jordan based on his own consent. Um, so if we're considering the substance use minor consent laws, family code 6929, we know that anyone who's 12 or older may consent to services. Um, so Jordan's 14, so we have that covered. Um, the question is, uh, is this a drug or potentially a drug or alcohol related problem? If we look um, here, it says he's been using codeine. Um, that, is, uh, that has as its uh, underlying substance, something that would be on the Uniform Controlled Substances Act. Um, and our question is, does he have um, a substance use disorder that requires some diagnosis? And we know that the law uh, includes, if we look at the definition, medical care includes um, the ability to do medical diagnosis as well as treatment. So in this case, Jordan would be able to consent to using a screening tool to evaluate whether he has the substance use uh, disorder. Um, and he would also be able to uh, consent to uh, any kind of medical 
care medical exam um, related to that diagnosis or treatment. Um, now let's imagine that the, the school-based health center wants to refer Jordan to a program on campus that provides substance use disorder counseling. Um, Jordan adamantly does not want his parents to know. May Jordan consent to participate in this counseling without parent or guardian consent? What else might you need to know to answer this question? So this is why it's important to remember our mental health counseling statutes because there's actually three different statutes that may apply and allow uh, Jordan to consent to uh, counseling services on his own behalf. And it would be helpful to look at all three of those um, in order to assess whether he's able to consent. Um, and now I just wanna note this, this isn't necessarily the obligation of the school-based health center. It may be the obligation of the counseling program to understand what the minor consent rules are. But when we're looking to see whether uh, Jordan can consent to counseling in this program, it could be helpful to understand the funding source for this counseling. Um, so uh, for example, as if we look at the definition of uh, counseling under the substance use disorder uh, consent law, um, does, does the counseling program meet this definition? Um, if not, let's look at the mental health uh, consent statutes. Um, in that case, it may be that we need to go to the criteria, not just that Jordan is 12 or older, but that Jordan is also mature enough to participate intelligently in the services being provided, for example. So um, just uh, it is helpful to know the criteria for all three laws and know what, um, if you particularly, if you are the pro program providing this counseling, um, sort of what the, the scope is and which of these laws is most relevant for you, given the funding sources, um, the types of services that you're providing, et cetera. Now there are certain um, substance use disorder treatments that uh, require parent consent. Um, of course, if we're talking about a minor who is under age 12, any services would require parent consent. Uh, what also uh, um, requires parent consent is uh, uh, certain kinds of medication treatment. So if this were um, any medication assisted treatment that involves, uh, for example, opioid replacement, that would require parent consent. Um, to that end, it's also really important to highlight that there are federal laws and regulations that apply when we are considering uh, medication assisted treatment and that may impact consent, parent consent and access to medication. So just as one example, opioid treatment programs that are operating under a SAMHSA certification must meet certain federal regulations. And one of those regulations says that a person under age 18 must have at least two documented unsuccessful attempts at short-term detox or drug-free treatment within a 12-month period in order to be eligible for maintenance treatment and the opioid treatment program would not be able to admit someone um, for maintenance tr treatment until they have that documentation and until they have parent legal guardian or responsible adult consent in writing. So if you are someone who provides medication assisted treatment, really important not just to take a look at our state law, but also be very familiar with the federal regulations that may apply to you or to your program. Now, um, one thing we just wanted to flag, um, this is unique to this minor consent statute for substance use treatment. The statute explicitly addresses the question, may a parent seek care for their minor child even if the minor refuses? And what the statute says is that it is the intent of the legislature that the state shall respect the right of a parent or legal guardian to seek medical care and counseling for a drug or alcohol related problem of a minor child when the child does not consent to the medical care and counseling and nothing in this section shall be construed to restrict or eliminate this right. So there are certain statutes that give minors the right to consent to care and by definition, take that right away from parents. So only the minor can consent to care, um, this type of care. 
this is not one of those minor uh, parents may consent to care on behalf of their child. Um, how you implement this in the context of ethics and practice is up to your clinic and consultation with your legal counsel and with risk management, um, but it is important to know that this is a component of the law. All right, so let's look at another uh, case. Um, Stacy 16, she was brought to the Federally Qualified Health Center for her annual health exam. While speaking with the provider in private, Stacy acknowledged that she's been using her parents' prescription for OxyContin for anxiety since she started high school. She's running low and starting to feel anxious about not having any more. Um, the provider talks with Stacy about substance use and Stacy decides she would like to be connected to services, but doesn't want their parent to know. May Stacy engage in this conversation without needing parent or guardian consent? So does, uh, under the statutes we just reviewed, does uh, Stacy have the right or the ability to consent to substance use um, diagnosis um, and treatment on her own behalf? Um, so we know that she is um, uh, 16, so she's over 12 years old. Um, so she meets that condition. Um, the substances that she has been using are on the list and considered part of drug or alcohol for the purposes of this statute. Um, and diagnosis and uh, um, uh, doing sort of initial screening is part of the definition of the services that she's able to consent to under the statute. So yes, Stacy is able to engage in this conversation without needing parent or guardian consent. Now let's say that Stacy is referred to the drug treatment program at her local children's hospital. Which services might she be able to access without parent consent? Evaluation, outpatient counseling, physical exam, inpatient hospitalization. Um, and the answer is she has the right to consent to all four of those under this statute if they, um, uh, as sort of as they move through and as they evaluate and determine um, what is the best medical care for her. Um, what happens if after multiple attempts at counseling and group therapy, the program believes medication assisted treatment um, would be best for Stacy? May she consent to medication assisted treatment on her own behalf? Um, so as we know, no, that would require parent consent. Um, so what, what do they do next? Does the program tell Stacy to come back when she has parent permission and let her figure it out? Um, does the program contact Stacy's parents? Um, do they offer to contact her parents and ask Stacy for permission? Um, do they offer to contact her parents and ask her for written authorization? Um, so obviously we haven't gone through all the laws. This uh, highlights though why it's so important to also understand um, release of information. Um, rules and confidentiality rules, because it, particularly when you're providing minor consent care and there is potentially a, a point where you may need parent consent, understanding um, parent engagement and uh, who can authorize release of information is critical. Um, so, so far the rules that we've looked at tell us about how we open that door to treatment, um, but that hasn't told us which confidentiality laws apply. It hasn't told us um, uh, you know, how we create referral and collaboration spaces. Um, and it also hasn't talked about uh, insurance and coverage and, and how confidentiality and consent relate to that. Um, we don't have time today to cover that second bullet, but I do wanna take just a little bit of time to cover the first one, uh, which relates back to sort of the situation we just found Stacy in. So when we're talking about medical confidentiality laws, one reason this gets so confusing is that we actually have a number of laws sometimes that we need to take into account. At the federal level, we have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, HIPAA, um, and that applies and sets a ground floor for uh, confidentiality of medical information across all the country. Um, we also have state laws um, and HIPAA says to the extent that our state laws are provide more confidentiality, we defer to state law. And California does have two state laws that provide some additional protection, particularly for um, 
uh, minor consent services. And so it is important for us to understand how those apply. And those are the Confidentiality of Medical Information Act and the Landerman Petrie Short Act. And then in addition, um, depending on the type of services being provided, the provider, the funding stream, there may be other laws that apply um, both at the federal and state level. And one example is 42 CFR part two, which applies to protect many substance use um, disorder treatment uh, records and information. And so what I wanna do now is just very quickly talk about how um, HIPAA and state law work, and then we'll talk about 42 CFR and to whom that applies. So uh, if we look at HIPAA and state law, the general rule is that a healthcare provider must protect the confidentiality of personal health information um, that is uh, created or shared in a provider patient um, setting. And in general, providers must have a signed authorization in order to share protected health information. The word authorization comes from HIPAA, and I like to use that just to really separate it from consent um, and make clear the difference between consent to treatment and authorization to release information. Now, even though the general rule is we need a signed release, there are exceptions that allow providers to share information with other individuals or agencies without need of that release in some contexts, such as for child abuse reporting, in order to coordinate treatment or referrals, um, et cetera. But let's talk about that signed release for just a second. Under state law, the minor must sign a release if records relate to services the minor consented to or could have consented to. So all of the minor consent laws we just looked at, if we're talking about services um, it, within sort of that scope, the minor signs the release of authorization. Otherwise, it's the parent or guardian. There's also a lot of rules about what an authorization needs to look like. This is just a couple examples I wanna highlight. Um, California law requires that a release be in 14 point font. That's pretty big. So making sure that your release complies with these rules is important. And this is one of those places where talking to legal counsel and risk management is really valuable to make sure that um, any release you're using is complying with whatever combination of laws um, you're operating under, whether it's HIPAA, uh, state law, uh, 42 CFR, et cetera. Um, now, what about parent access, even when there is minor consent? Um, we don't have time to dig deep into that. There are resources on our website, but what I just want to, um, the message I want to send is that um, it's complicated. When a parent consents to care, it doesn't always mean that the parent has an absolute right to information about services. And in the same way, when a minor consents to care, it doesn't always mean that parents get absolutely no information. It depends on the laws that apply in that context, the services being provided. Um, so it's really important to talk to legal counsel about what applies in your particular context and what those exceptions are. When you can say no to a parent, when you have to let your minor clients know that a parent may be able to access information, et cetera, because it's important to be able to communicate that clearly to your clients. Um, what about some of the other exceptions that allow uh, providers to disclose information without needing that authorization? There are a number of them. We don't have time to go through them all now. Just really wanna highlight that there are uh, quite a few, and they're designed to facilitate coordination of care, payment, um, addressing emergencies. Um, so just really important to work through that with legal counsel, look for other resources. Now, this has been a very quick summary of state law and HIPAA, but what about 42 CFR part two? So 42 CFR part two is actually called the Comprehensive Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism Prevention, Treatment and Rehabilitation Act, CAPTR. Um, it, they're federal regulations that restrict the disclosure and use of patient identifying information about individuals in substance use treatment programs if those programs are subject to 42 CFR. Um, so not every single program or every single substance use treatment service is covered by 42 CFR, but if it is, you need to follow these federal rules and they are some of the most restrictive, 
confidentiality laws um, that we have. So really important to know if they apply to you and what they say. Um, so what, do they apply to you? There are two primary uh, requirements, um, conditions. Um, if you are federally assisted, and that means that you're authorized by a federal agency to conduct maintenance treatment or withdrawal management, you're registered to dispense under the Controlled Substance Act, or you have tax exempt status um, or are, are receiving tax deductible donations. Um, so for example, a nonprofit um, hospital that has tax exempt status would meet that federally assisted um, prong. Second, the provider, whether it's an individual provider or a program, must be an individual or entity that holds itself out as providing substance use disorder diagnosis treatment or referral, um, or be an identified unit within a general facility that holds itself out as doing so. So for example, a program within a hospital, um, or be medical personnel or other staff in a facility whose primary function is to provide um, substance use disorder diagnosis, treatment, or referral. Um, if you meet those two prongs, then you must comply with 42 CFR Part 2 confidentiality rules. Um, what do those rules say? It's really important to get them really clear, so I don't have time today to cover them in great detail. I just want to highlight that the general rule is that you cannot disclose patient identifying information unless there's a written authorization. There are a few exceptions that allow disclosure without need of that authorization, but they're very limited, um, much more limited than we see under state law or HIPAA. And there are very strict limits on redisclosure of information. So if you've received information from a 42 CFR part two program, your ability to redisclose that information is really, really restricted. Um, who signs a release of information um, for a 42 CFR part two program? Because those releases are so important. Um, if the minor consented to the care, then the minor must sign. If a parent consented to care, the minor and the parent must sign. Um, what about parent access? Um, again, this is something that is um, complicated and it's important to work through. Parent access is pretty restricted, but it would take a multi-hour uh, webinar to walk through that. So the, the best thing is to say, talk to legal counsel about how you handle that, particularly if you are providing medication assisted treatment under parent consent, um, navigating what parents have access to um, is really important. Um, what must a 42 CFR part two authorization form include? Um, it includes any of the HIPAA requirements. Um, in addition, it needs to include this information, um, including information on the right to revoke and, not and notice about limits on re-release. Um, as I said, there are some exceptions that allow a a program or a provider under 42 CFR Part 2 to share information without a release. They're very um, limited. Here's just a few examples. That said, um, 42 CFR Part 2 regulations were updated this year. Um, uh, some information started rolling out about those updates this summer. Um, several of those updates were designed to facilitate sharing of information to make it a little bit easier to coordinate um, around referrals, um, to coordinate within programs, um, and to facilitate payment. Um, there is a website, the Health, uh, Federal Department of Health and Human Services has some information that provides um, sort of nice summaries of what some of those key updates are. Here's a, a link to one example, um, but this also is something where it's really important to work with risk management and um, your legal counsel to understand how those updates might impact your day-to-day -day practice if you are a 42 CFR Part 2 program. Um, I wanted to just flag this website because there are often questions about uh, uh, how you um, use insurance when you're providing confidential minor consent care. If you're using a parent's insurance to pay for it, there 
are laws that allow minors to limit a parent's ability to sort of see what services um, are, they're accessing through parents' insurance, this website can provide more information about it. Um, teenhealthlaw.org is a website run by the National Center for Youth Law that provides some more information on minor consent laws, including confidentiality laws. And we are excited to let you know that we have just updated um, and created, created an expanded minor consent chart that summarizes um, the uh, Family Code 6929 Substance Use Disorder Treatment Minor Consent um, laws and answers many of the questions that were presented in today's webinar. And that is now currently uh, available on the California School Health Alliance website. Um, Sierra, I'm not sure if you have the actual link you want to share. I just I just chatted it. Um, so the link that I just put in the chat box is a link to this grid. Excellent. Um, and now we have time to get to any uh, questions that may have come in or if there's uh, folks who want to share information about their own practices. Um, so we had a few questions come in. There were two that were surrounding the forms um, that you mentioned. The first one was, does FERPA require 14 point font for ROIs? Um, so FERPA has its, uh, so FERPA, just for those who aren't aware, is the um, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And it is a law that protects uh, records created by um, public schools, public school personnel, um, and uh, it has it. It has a very similar law in a rule, sort of saying in general you can't share information without parent consent. And it does have its own requirements around what a consent form needs to look like um, in order to be valid. Um, it does not require 14 point font, but it does require some uh, other similar. Um, uh, uh, criteria that you see in HIPAA. And we do have um, in the HIPAA FERPA primer and on the um, CSHA website, more information about exactly what is required for a FERPA authorization form and for a HIPAA authorization form. And I will go ahead and chat um, a link to our website where you can find more information about HIPAA and FERPA. Um, the second question about forms is, what is a compound signature? Great question. So compound, um, HIPAA says that you cannot use a compound signature for a release form or it will be considered invalid. And compound means that you're using the same signature to, to authorize more than one thing. And one of the most uh, uh, common ways you see um, this is a release form that says, I consent to treatment and I consent to release of information. And there's just one signature line. So you're requiring them with that one signature to consent to two different things. If you had, I consent to treatment line uh, for signature, I consent to release of information line for signature, that's no longer a compound um, release uh, uh, because you've given them the ability to sort of break those things apart. So that's what it, they mean by compound. Um, the next question is, with SUD treatment options on school campuses, how does that intersect with FERPA and the minor not wanting their parents to know? So th that's a great question. It's really, really important to understand which confidentiality laws apply. Um, so for example, school employees like school nurses, records that they create are subject to FERPA um, and they're not subject to HIPAA and that will impact how, whether or not parents may be able to access that information. Um, when a, an outside program brings medical care to a school site, it, they may well still be operating under HIPAA. Um, and that would mean um, that sort of who is able to access information um, on staff as well as a parent's ability to access information will be different. So it's really important to know which laws apply um, to the records and information being created by that program on site and make sure that all the folks in the room understand that. So does the principal understand? Does the provider understand um, ahead of time so that you don't 
have uh, problems. Uh, um, and so we always recommend that you try to sit down with the teams before or at the beginning when you're bringing programs on site so that everybody is on the same page about what the rules are. Because it's not just about parent access, it's also about can I work with you and partner with you if you're the school nurse or you're the principal or you're the teacher and I'm the healthcare provider. I may want to, but confidentiality laws prevent me from doing that, for example. Um, how does this apply to nicotine replacement treatments? I guess they're, and I'm assuming they're talking about the, the laws. Yeah, so I think we had that on our slide. Um, let's see, but um, this, uh, this substance use disorder treatment law um, only applies to what we call drug or alcohol and the definitions does not include nicotine. So minors cannot consent to tobacco related um, treatment uh, programs under this statute. Let's see, did I, maybe we didn't put it on the slide. We might not have put it on the slide, but it does not, it does not include nicotine because that is not on the Uniform Controlled Substances Act and it's not explicitly called out in the definition in the statute. Um, next question is, as a SUD provider, we get calls from referring parties about status of a referral. Can we share when an initial intake appointment is scheduled, keeping in mind that this would be before we even meet the youth? Um, so that, yeah, that's a great question. We actually, in a, another version of this, uh, use that as a case study. Um, and this is where it's really important to understand which confidentiality laws um, you're operating under. So for example, under the California Medical Information Act in HIPAA, there is an exception that allows providers to uh, speak to each other, provider to provider, in order to facilitate treatment and coordination of care, including referrals. And so the law um, would not prevent um, if I'm, say, a pediatrician and I've made a referral to um, a specialty uh, program, it would not prevent me from calling that program, letting them know that, they're, that I've made this referral and checking in on whether my patient has actually uh, called them up and, and made an appointment. However, that kind of coordination would be prevented under 42 CFR Part 2. 42 CFR Part 2 doesn't have an exception that allows for that kind of outside um, provider to provider referral. So if you are that pediatrician making a referral to a substance use program that's under 42 CFR part two, and you want the ability to follow up and make sure that there's that warm handoff, you may wanna ask your client for a release form saying, can I just have this release to make sure that I can help make sure you're connected to care. Now, oftentimes when I say the law allows it and I'm doing a presentation with a provider, the provider will jump in and say, just because the law allows it doesn't mean that that's best practice or that's what you should do. Um, and they may say, I would, for example, my practice in my clinic or my ethical obligations say, I would never make that kind of call without explicitly getting client permission. Um, and that's fine. And that can be very valuable to creating client um, provider relationships and trust. It's just important to know um, if that's about ethical obligations versus what the law requires. Um, great, I don't see any other questions. If anyone wants to chat or add to the Q&A box, we have like a few more minutes um, as we wrap up here, just a few, housekeeping items. Um, Rebecca's gonna get us down to the last slide, clicking all the way through. And there is a slide with our contact information if you would like to reach out to either of us. Oop, there it is. Um, also, once the webinar is closed, a window will automatically pop up that will have an evaluation. It's just five multiple choice questions. If you all could please answer them, they really help us inform and improve our webinars. Um, I think that's it on our end. I'm so surprised <laughs> that we don't have more questions, but that's that's fantastic. Um, I think, oh, where can we access the copy of the, of the, um, so the recording will have the, not only the slides, it'll be a visual recording, it'll be a video. 
of both the slides um, and Rebecca speaking. So, and those will be available on our website. And we will also send an email to all, um, everyone who registered with a link to that recording. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. And we will see you next time. Thank you. Bye.